I am very, very excited to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Mark Bullimore. Professor Bullimore is an internationally renowned scientist, speaker, and educator based in Boulder, Colorado. He received his optometry degree and PhD in vision science from Aston University in Birmingham, England. He, his ex expertise in myopia, contact lenses, low vision, presbyopia, and refractive surgery means that he's a consultant for a number of companies and his work has resulted in the approval of many different uh, devices and, and therapies. So we are very lucky to have him sharing his knowledge today. Dr. Bullimore, take it away. Well, thanks for that kind uh, introduction, uh, Stephanie. Um, so here's my topic for this morning. Um, I do have an affiliation with the University of Houston, much like Dr. Uh, Dr. Ariel, who's going to be talking later. Um, but most of my Life is spent consulting with companies big and small, and uh, some of them are listed here. And if you're paying attention, you know that many of these have an interest in uh, the area of myopia, um, including today's sponsor, Cuba Vision. Now, um, I have provided a handout, which, of course, in the last 24 hours has been made a little out of date as I tweak things. Um, but if you want to uh, find um, additional reading um, based on some of the things I'm talking about today, you can go to my website, bullers2020.com, and on the front page, you'll see a little link here, uh, recommended reading on myopia management. And that will take you to a list of papers, many of which I will talk about today, uh, many of which I've co-authored. Um, but the bottom line is that I'm not going to try and sell you anything. This is just intended for your uh, in Richmond. Um, you can also reach me through that page as well, although I've already shown you my uh, email address. So the question I often encounter is why all this interest in myopia? Why, you know, we learned about it at school, but why all of a sudden is myopia or myopia control or myopia management? Why is that a big deal all of a sudden? When, and my answer is uh, threefold. First of all, there's an increase in prevalence around the world and uh, the USA is uh, no exception. Um, we're getting a better understanding of the complications and uh, implications of myopia and higher levels of myopia. And finally, it's I think mainly because we have the ability to do something about it. Um, and to draw an analogy or two analogies, um, if we go back a couple of decades, there wasn't a lot of buzz around dry eye but the um, approval of restasis and subsequent products um, and then the approval of devices um, to treat dry eye has led to a great deal of interest. So a product has increased our market and you could make the same comment about some other things in the general field like uh, Viagra and ED. Um, so why myopia? Well, we have the ability now to do something about it. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the options later in this presentation. Um, and really, that's why we talk about it now amongst ourselves and with patients. Um, even if we were aware of the complications of myopia 20 years ago, it wasn't something you would talk to your patient about, because when they said, hey, can anything be done about it? You'd say, oh, sorry, no. And you look like an idiot. Um, but now we can do something about it. So what are the... Uh, benefits of slowing myopia progression or um, reducing the incidence of myopia. And Noel Brennan and I published this paper a few years ago. It's on the website. If you can't access a copy, let me know. Um, and we said in this that really with myopia, we should care about the long-term visual health of every patient and not just address their current visual needs. And I would take that a step further. With a young child, we should, um, even if they're not yet myopic, we should think about what their trajectory is likely to be um, and uh, predict what their probability of myopia might be um, and then perhaps take some steps to prevent it. But there are three long-term benefits of lowering a patient's ultimate myopic destination. Um, first of all, um, the less myopia you have, the better vision you obviously have uncorrected, but your corrected vision is uh, better as well. And we talk a little bit about that in the paper. Um, remember as well, the myopic child of this, morning, of this morning, of today, 
will likely be a refractive surgery candidate of tomorrow. Um, so there's better options for lower myopes and better outcomes um, with various surgical myopic correction. I sat next to a guy on the plane yesterday who had uh, had, had PRK and I knew what he was going to tell me and I, when I asked why PRK and not LASIK and of course it had to do with the thickness of his corneas and the, uh, the level of myopia he had. But finally um, and most importantly their um, slow in myopia progression can reduce the risk of visual impairment associated with higher levels of myopia. So in that paper, one of the things we did, we gathered together some data on myopic maculopathy from five large scale studies across three continents. And um, this represents data from, I think, around 21,000 patients. Now you can see that there's an exponential increase in the prevalence of myopic maculopathy with increase in levels of myopia. But the remarkable thing is when we put that onto a logarithmic scale, all of those lines seem to have a very similar slope. And the average slope was about 1.67. So what that means is that every additional diopter of myopia increases your risk of myopic maculopathy later in life, these are older patients, um, by around 67%. Flip that on its head, every diopter less, every diopter progression we could prevent will reduce the risk of myopic maculopathy by 40%. How do we get to 40%? The math is there. It's one over, sorry, one minus one over uh, 1.67. That gives you 60%. So you're reducing the risk by 40%. Now, since then, some other things have happened. Um, first of all, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, in collaboration with some other um, organizations, including the uh, American Academy of Optometry, um, they released this sort of, they formed this task force and released this initial statement um, where they talk about reducing the global um, burden of myopia by delay and onset and slow in progression. So some of you in practice may encounter ophthalmologists and other physicians who are somewhat resistant to the idea of myopia control. Show them this. OK, the Academy of Ophthalmology is engaged. This is not an optometry thing. This is an eye care professional thing. Now, just after that was published, um, we, um, my colleagues and I, um, an international group here, published this paper on the risks of benefit, uh, risks and benefit of myopia control. And we kind of built on that previous work with myopic maculopathy to look at some other conditions. So here we're seeing the uh, relationship between level of myopia and the prevalence of open angle glaucoma. And again, across a range of studies, the trajectory is fairly consistent. Um, and each additional diopter increases a patient's risk of open angle glaucoma by 20%. Same for this one particular kind of cataract, uh, PSC each diopter of myopia increases the risk by 21%. And that's the only um, kind of cataract where we see this relationship. Obviously, nuclear opacity later in life will increase the level of myopia, but when you look at axial length data, the relationship is not there. It's, a, it's an effect rather than cause. And finally, of course, what we all learned about at school, there's an increased risk of retinal detachment and each diopter increases the risk by 30%. And that's true whether you're looking at annual incidence or the data at the top from a long time ago from uh, Switzerland, uh, the lifetime incidence, okay? Still a relatively rare condition, um, but we're working on this to understand a little bit more about that. Now, most importantly, of course, is visual impairment. And in that risk and benefit paper, we took data from a large study from the Netherlands and looked at the cumulative risk of visual impairment as a function of level of myopia. And again, I'm using a logarithmic scale here because it makes the math easier. Um, and what you can see here is there's a steady increase in the risk of visual impairment, regardless of age, um, with increasing levels of myopia. And in particular, if you look down at what we might call the, the common levels of myopia between minus two and minus eight, those slopes are remarkably consistent. 
and the slopes are around about 1.3. So each day up to more of myopia increases a patient risk of visual impairment later in life by around about 30%. And these are the researchers raw data. This is visual impairment based on around, uh, based on a criteria of 2060. Okay. So what that also means, of course, every diopter we could prevent would reduce the risk of visual impairment later in life by 25%. Now we are of course, assuming that what we do now will have benefit later in life. Do we know that for sure? No, we haven't shown that. It would take a 60 year prospective study to actually demonstrate that intervening early would reduce the outcomes later. That's not gonna happen, certainly in my lifetime and in anybody's lifetime. Um, but it's a reasonable assumption to suggest that if we are slow in myopia and ultimately reducing somebody's ultimate level of myopia, we're gonna have some long-term benefit. We can project this to the US population in 2050. This is what the US population is gonna look like. Um, I'll still be drinking, of course. There'll be about 400 million people in the US, okay? About half of them will be myopic. That's a stat you hear all the time. Um, so around 200 million will be myopic. But amongst those, using a criteria of 2040 or worse, around 19, 19 million will be visually impaired. Why? Because myopia is increasing and the population's getting older. And more remarkably, perhaps about two thirds of those visually impaired patients will be myopes, okay? Now, not all of that, not all of the visual impairment is due to their myopia, but remarkably, about a third of all visual impairment is directly attributable or will be directly attributable to the increased risk of eye disease associated with myopia, okay? So it's a big deal. And if we could even take the average down by half a diopter, okay? If on average we could slow myopia in everybody by half a diopter, or we could uh, reduce the ultimate level of myopia by delaying its onset, that would save 1 million cases of visual impairment, okay? So it's a big public health issue. These are our own calculations, um, but the numbers I think uh, are quite compelling. So I'm gonna spend most of the presentation now talking about the current treatment options. So before we do that, let's just think about um, how we assess evidence. And we live in an evidence-based medicine world, okay? And we know that there are different levels of evidence. Randomized clinical trials are considered the gold standard. And down at the bottom, um, are the opinions of so-called experts like me, okay? But of course, what I'm gonna show you today, um, all the evidence is gonna be based on um, largely randomized clinical trials, okay? Now, up above that, you can even say that there's a higher level of evidence. So if you take a bunch of studies, preferably randomized controlled studies, and look at the data across them, you can do a thing called a meta-analysis. Okay, so there your researchers are synthesizing results from a host of studies to come up with a more conclusive result. Okay, so that's even more compelling than a single randomized clinical trial. And for some of our um, um, interventions, we have enough data um, to do meta-analyses, and I'll show you some of those um, during the course of this presentation. In others, for example, soft um, multifocal lenses, there's so much vari uh, variation across the designs, it would perhaps be inappropriate to conduct a met uh, meta-analysis. So um, anyway, and of course, that we now have a, um, in the social media age, we also have an even lower level of evidence where anybody on social media or any elected official can be a so-called expert and spout their opinion about things like COVID or anything else. Now, when it comes to evaluating studies of myop myopia efficacy, there's some things that we like to see. And some of them, of course, are consistent with any intervention. First of all, we would like to see randomized clinical trials, preferably of at least two years in duration. And the reason for that will be clear in a minute. Um, we'd like to see masking. Um, so when possible, the investigator and the subject doesn't know what 
um, their allocation was. Um, we use masking, of course, in eye studies rather than uh, blinding. Um, we also would like to see two different outcome measures. Uh, refractive error, obviously, that by definition is important when it comes to myopia. Um, but the best way to measure that is, first of all, under cycloplegia, because we're dealing with children. And secondly, with an autorefractor, because autorefractors are far more repeatable than um, a subjective refraction. We also like to see axial length measurements. And of course, uh, axial length has been revolutionized in the last 20 years with the uh, introduction of the IOR master, then a lens star, and a whole host of other optical biometers. And the precision of these instruments is really quite remarkable. And when it comes to clinical trials, that really, in many of our eyes, is becoming the gold standard because, um, first of all, it's far more repeatable than measures of refraction. And also, of course, it's unaffected by changes to the optical components of the eye. So in studies of ortho K, refractive error is rarely used as an outcome measure. OK, um, because, of course, we flatten the cornea, we've temporarily eliminated or reduced the patient's myopia. We can't use refractive error as an outcome measure. Likewise, with atropine, you know, we're tamping, tampering with the ciliary muscle. Um, maybe only to a small degree, but we're altering the optical components of the eye. So we really need to rely on axial length measurements rather than refractive error measurements in both of those instances. Um, as I show you later, um, for spectacles and for soft lenses, there's a very high correlation between um, progression of myopia and axial elongation. So you don't necessarily need to be measuring um, axial length in practice for looking at spectacle lens therapies and soft contact lenses. But that's probably where the field is going um, and certainly a number of manufacturers are hoping. Uh, one thing to remember when we discuss uh, results, um, 0.1 of a millimeter is roughly equivalent to uh, a quarter of a diopter. So when I am showing you ortho K results, you should expect 0.1 millimeters to correspond to 0.25 diopters. And in some studies, I'll show you both. And hopefully, you'll be able to see whether the diopters agree with the millimeters or not, because there's one glaring example when they don't. And we need to discuss that a little bit. And finally, um, you'll notice today when I'm talking about the efficacy of myopia, I'm going to be talking in millimeters or diopters. I'm not going to talk about percentage treatment effects because that can be horribly misleading. And we discussed this in a, a paper that my colleagues and I um, published last year. You can access this again through the website. It's an easy title to remember. And the paper, thanks to my friends at Johnson & Johnson, is open access, OK? Now, you may get a little bit of, shock, of a shock when you download the PDF because it is, including the references, 30 pages long. But let me just give you the highlights of the, some of the highlights of the paper um, so you can get a sense of some of the things that we talk about in there. OK, but if you're getting seriously into, um, into myopia, um, this would be a challenging but a good read for you. OK. But even if you look at the abstract, you'll see some of the things and maybe you can dip in and out of the paper as you go forward. So I would commend this to you. I would recommend that you read our risk benefits paper, which I highlighted earlier. And then Catherine Richdale and I, um, colleague from University of Houston, we did a comprehensive review um, that was published at the beginning of 2020, where we talk about some of the um, methods of myopia control, but also some, offer some clinical pearls of when to start, when to stop, how to uh, approach some of these things. So, <clears throat> as I said earlier, percentages are misleading, and here's one of the reasons why. So what I'm showing you here um, is a direct screenshot from uh, that paper, and um, what we're looking at here in the top and the bottom left is axial elongation in both treated subjects and control subjects um, as a function of the patient's baseline age. And you can see two things. First of all, the younger eyes grow faster, okay? We know that progression is faster in younger children. 
okay so if you look at the 12 month data you can see that the kids who are eight years of age are growing perhaps twice as fast as the kids who are 12 years of age okay so when somebody says normal myopic progression is this or normal axial elongation is this don't believe them okay because it is very age dependent and it's also race dependent asian eyes grow about 30 to 40 percent faster asian myopia progresses about 30 to 40 percent faster so there's no single number okay but fortunately we're developing growth curves so you can start to put those things in context okay the other thing you can see is the two lines are parallel in the top graph and the one on the left so what that's showing you is when you look at the progression as or axial elongation as a function of age um, in the treated and control eyes, the treatment effect in terms of millimeters of slowing of axial elongation is constant um, across um, the, the age range, okay? Why does that matter? Well, if you looked at young eyes, you might see a percentage treatment effect of 30, 40, maybe 50%, okay? If you looked at the older eyes, you'd see a much higher percentage treatment effect, okay? So this is the fallacy of talking about percentage treatment effect for myopia control. It's very age dependent, okay? So think in terms of diopters and millimeters. Now, the bottom right, which I've ignored to date, are refractive error data from the MySight study. These are the data you can find in the physician or clinician labeling um, approved by the FDA. And again, the, the slopes are uh, opposite because we're talking about refractive error change here, but you can see the same trends, okay? Look at the control subjects, which are the black circles down at the bottom. What you can see is the younger subjects are progressing much faster than the older subjects, okay? So the eight-year-olds progress maybe one and a half diopters over three years. Um, the 12 year olds only a diopter or so. But look at the data for the MySight kids at the top, all right? Obviously, there's a significant slowing of, my, of refractive error. And as I'll show you later, also a significant slowing of axial elongation. But what we see is um, two parallel lines, okay? The treatment effect is the same across ages. And again, if you were to talk about the youngest kids here, the treatment effect would be 40, 50%. In the oldest kids, it's about 70, 80%, okay? But in reality, the diopters that we're slowing down is constant across the age range. Now, this next graph um, shows the reduction in axial elongation, okay, as a function of the years studied or the years um, the patient undergoes treatment. So these, this graph is 22 studies. They're listed on the, on the, uh, the right there um, by first author. And these are 22 studies where you have at least two years of data, um, where you have a control group and you have a reasonable treatment effect. So there are some studies not shown on here, like the Comet study for PALs, which I'm gonna explain later, um, because the treatment is virtually ineffective, okay? So these are the things that work and kind of work, okay? So what we're doing here is we're plotting, if you like, the treatment effect for all of these different interventions um, in different years of the study. So we're doing as a cumulative reduction in axial elongation. And what you can see, particularly for the more effective therapies, the one shown close to the top, is the treatment effect is much greater in the first year than it is in the second, and in some cases, third year, okay? And when you look at some of the studies that, um, that, have con that present two years of data, typically the treatment effect in the second year is about half what it is in the first year. And if you look at three year studies with three years of data, a good rule of thumb is that what you get in years two and three is about the same as what you get in year one, okay? So the treatment effect, the benefit of our myopia control therapy is clearly 
greatest in the first year and slightly lower in subsequent years. And what we're seeing where we do have now six years of data emerging, like in the MySite cohort, um, there's a reasonably consistent treatment effect in years two and beyond. So years two and six, you've got a reasonable uh, or reasonably consistent treatment effect, but nothing like you see in the first year. Um, if you're curious, what's the, the most effective therapy? That's atropine 1% at the top. But you can see you've got a remarkable first year effect with the, the, uh, the first year of 1% myopia treatment, and then a much more modest second year treatment. Um, the, 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 the open, if you're looking for other studies, um, the open circles that extend to three years, that's the MySite data, okay? Um, and uh, uh, you can, if you know the first authors, you can get a sense of what's going on there. So why is that important? Well, there are some excellent myopia calculators out there. And the one I'm showing you here is from the BHVI, Brian Holden Vision Institute. And what you can do is you can put in the patient's current age, their current refractive error, and their ethnicity, because that's an important effect. And the red line at the bottom there will show you their projected trajectory. Okay. So if we do nothing, what's the what's our best guess of what the child's prescription is gonna be at the age of 17, okay? And the red line is excellent, okay? It's really good data, it's evidence-based, and it is incredibly valuable for the point of sale when you're talking about myopia control with your, the parents of your patient, okay? It's a very compelling demonstration, okay? What's not so good is the green line, okay? So, it assumes a percentage treatment effect, okay? But it also assumes the same treatment effect in every year of the treatment, okay? That is a fantasy, okay? The treatment effect in the first year is gonna be better than any subsequent years. The other thing is if we go back to the previous slide, all right, we don't have that much data beyond two years and none of the therapies which I'm showing you here have shown more than about 0.4 millimeters or one diopter of slowing of elongation, okay? So in the peer reviewed literature, there are some five and seven year studies of ortho K, but they only show a cumulative treatment effect of about 0.1 millimeters or about one diopter. Now, they're not published yet, but there's six year data from my site suggesting that after over six years, you're getting about a 0.55 millimeter slowing of axial elongation and about a one and a half diopter slowing. But to present a patient or a parent with this and to suggest that if we put a kid on atropine for 10 years, we're gonna slow their myopia for th by three diopters, there's no evidence for that. And you have to ask yourself, is that a reasonable projection, okay? And the worst thing, of course, we can do with any patient and any therapy is to overpromise. So when talking with patients and parents about the potential, I would encourage you to sort of say, look, ignore the number at the top here, okay? Ignore the green line. They're gonna end up at minus six, but let's see if we can keep it below minus five or even minus four, okay? and explain, make yourself familiar with the evidence base and um, don't overpromise. Okay, so what can we do about myopia? So first of all, let's talk about behavioral measures. And we know from some compelling research around the world, and I'm gonna show you the American data, um, first of all, um, that there is a strong relationship between hours spent outside and the risk of myopia. So here's data from the, uh, the original Olson study. Um, so these are data out of California, but what you can see on the right here is what the, the more hours spent outdoors playing sports, the lower incidence of myopia, whether or not you have zero, one or two myopic parents, okay? Now these are observational data could we do something about this? Well, there have been clinical trials, and here's one of the early ones published 
about eight years ago. And they basically randomized schools, okay, to different approaches. One did the standard approach where the kids spent recess inside. Um, and then the ROC group, that was the recess outside group, um, they spent an additional 80 minutes a day outside. So that 40 minutes in the middle of the day and 20 minutes either side, they were outside for 80 minutes. And if you look at those dark gray bars in the middle there, or dark gray bands in the middle, um, in the control group over the duration of the study, nearly 18% of the patients um, who weren't myopic became myopic. Oh, sorry, let me rephrase that. 18% of the total population became myopic. Um, but in the outside group, the recess outside group, that about that was that number was reduced by about half. Okay, so this is a fairly modest intervention reducing the inset incidence of myopia. Okay, and that's a very big, powerful thing. So, if you are um, nervous about dipping your tool, toe, not dipping your tool, dipping your toes in the uh, myopic water, now, can we take that out of the video, Stephanie? Um, then and you're not ready to do contact lenses or spectacles or anything else for kids, this is something you can do as a public health professional right now, okay? In encourage kids to spend time outdoors. So here's one of those systemic reviews, meta-analyses I talked about earlier, and this is looking outdoor activities. And if you look on the right here, you can see, look at the risk of incident myopia, um, as a function of increased outdoor time per week. And you can see that sort of almost that sort of 50% um, reduction that I talked about in the previous slide based on about an hour a day or seven hours a week, okay? Now, all of the data here are below one, okay? Which means everybody's showing that outdoor time reduces the incidence of myopia. Now, when we look at the progression, okay, those same studies, most of them suggest that um, spending time outdoors is not associated with the rate of progression. Now, there are a couple of iffy examples at the bottom there that suggest there may be an association. Um, so this, again, is that same study I showed you earlier um, from about eight years ago. They looked at the myopes, okay, now, this was um, uh, conducted uh, in the Far East, and you can see there's a good chunk of the kids who are already myopes who are undergoing um, myopic um, atropine therapy. Um, we're not told in the paper what percentage that is. Um, but in terms of the myopes without atropine, there is a suggestion of a slowing of progression in the group that spent more time outdoors, but you'll see that it's not statistically significant in spite of the fact you've got roughly 100 kids in each of the groups. Um, there's also some excellent long, longitudinal data from uh, Dr. Parsonen and colleagues from Finland. Okay, remember Finland's a little different because they spend half their year in daylight and half their year in uh, constant darkness because they're so close to the uh, Arctic Circle. Um, but in their long-term study, they found that there was a relationship between outdoor activity and the rate of progression. And I don't have the data to show you today, but there is also some indirect evidence because we know that myopia progresses faster during the winter months and slower during the summer months. And the same is true for axial elongation. And again, that's a suggestion that the kids are spending more time outside during the, um, the summer months and less time outside during the winter months or there's more hours of daylight of course indirect evidence but i would say um, that the evidence is still pretty soft on whether outdoor activity slows myopia progression still a great thing to encourage okay think about diabetes think about obesity think about cardiovascular system think about what you're doing as a practitioner for the kids overall health so let's talk about spectacle lenses, okay? Um, first of all, under minus in is one of the worst things you can do. So here, there are two clinical trials published showing essentially the same thing. 
undercorrecting kids actually accelerates or increases the progression. So these are data from those two clinical trials and the white symbols or the open symbols are the kids who are fully corrected. The uh, black diamonds in both studies are the kids who are slightly and systematically under minus. And you can see that there's if anything, an increase in progression. So give the kid the full, full prescription, okay? And if a parent challenges you, these are the data you should uh, show them, okay? Um, it doesn't do any good and it may actually make things worse. And you know what's worse than giving the kids slightly blurry vision so they can't see the, the chalkboard. What about PALs? We've got remarkable consistency ac across most of the uh, rigorous studies in this area. Study on the left out of Hong Kong, study out on, on the right um, of um, I think over 300 patients um, uh, in the Comet study, maybe 400 patients. Anyway, so what you see is a consistent result. Two year study on the left, treatment effect of about 0.15 diopters. Uh, comet study, three-year study on the right, um, and uh, you only get well less than a quarter diopter of slowing of myopia and only about 0.1 millimeter slowing of axial elongation. Um, but look at the comet data down the bottom right. It's very clear that most of that treatment affects in the first year. So even on a relatively ineffective treatment, you can think, oh, I'm doing some good in the first year. Um, but you're just taking the parents' money to keep them in PALs beyond that because there's no different in the progression rate, okay? So an ineffective treatment. Now, the investigators were fairly rigorous about analyzing their data. And as I said, they had a shitload of patients to look at. So when they divided the patients into six groups based on their phoria, whether they were ESO, ortho, or exo, and their um, accommodative lag, they was a suggestion that the treatment effect was greater in the subjects with the accommodative lag and with an ESO posture. So what they did was a second study where they only recruited those kinds of children. So this is over 100 kids randomized again to PALs and single vision. But this time, the kids to get into this clinical trial had to at least had to have at least two prison diopters of uh, esophoria and a cognitive lag of over half a diopter. What did they find? Virtually the same as the first study, okay? Perhaps a more sustained effect, but there's nothing remarkable about putting a kid in a PAL just because they have esophoria. Study from Canada um, show, uh, looking at executive bifocals um, with or without some base in prism, you can see maybe a three quarter diopter slowing of myopia over three years. Um, and a slightly greater effect perhaps in the prison uh, group. But when you look at the axial elongation, there's no difference um, with the prison group. Um, but a suggestion here that executive bifocals um, are not only but ugly, but they may be effective um, at slowing myopia. Now, curiously, the Houston uh, myopia study or the Houston bifocal study found no effect um, 20 years or 30 years previously. Um, so this is the only or the best um, or the greatest effect of uh, bifocals. Now, most of our effect, effective therapies um, or optical therapies are based on putting plus in the periphery. And I'm gonna talk about the three groups here. And we know from a lot of very um, rigorous and beautiful work, um, including from my colleague, Earl Smith, um, that there's, an, there's a, an underlying basic science basis about why we should care about the periphery. We know that if we have conflicting optical signals between the fovea and the periphery in an animal model of myopia, the peripheral signals will dominate, okay? Likewise, if we put conflicting signals in the periphery, the more positive signals will, will dominate. And the further piece of evidence that, not, uh, that uh, Earl Smith presented is that most of our therapies that are effective have a peripheral component. Okay. So let's talk about various things. So let's talk first of all about orthokeratology. And the first study to sort of really rigorously show a slowing of myopia um, was, wasn't a randomized clinical trial, but Pauline Cho and colleagues showed that there was about a 0.25 millimeter slowing over two years with ortho -K. 
look again at the data on the bottom left, you'll see that most of the effect is in the first year of the study, okay? Well, Pauline and her colleagues did a randomized clinical trial and essentially replicated that result, about a 0.25 millimeter slowing over two years. And across continents and lens designs, the, the results for ortho K in this meta-analysis here um, are remarkably consistent, okay? About a 0.25 millimeter slowing over two years. Well, what about multi-zone contact lenses? Um, now the BHVI have done a lot of work. They published this paper a couple of years ago, big study. Um, unfortunately, only about half the, the subjects finished the study, but they looked at two kinds of lenses, sort of a multifocal and then um, an extended depth of focus design. And they had two flavors of each of those categories. What did they find? Well, if you look at the control group in the orange on the right, um, and then look at the blue lines, which are the different um, treatment uh, groups. Um, there was about a 0.15 millimeter slowing over two years for all of those. And one of those lenses has now been marketed in Europe. Now, of course, the big deal in the US was the approval of the MySight lens. And you can see here that you've got almost a 0.3 millimeter slowing and about a 0.75 diopter slowing of myopia progression. OK, and again, as I said earlier, in these kind of therapies, you see a good correlation between axial length and uh, refractive error. So you, if you're monitoring patients in these lenses, I wouldn't consider axial length measurement to be mandatory. And now, finally, the Blink study was published last year. This was using a, an off-label design, the Cooper Vision Biofinity. But what they had here was about 300 kids that were randomized to single vision a medium ad and a high ad. What did they find? The medium ad was ineffective, okay? Very little effect over three years, worse than a PAL. But the high ad was more effective. So clearly we've got evidence here for a dose response. So more power should be um, uh, important. What would happen if you went into an even higher ad? I don't know. We don't know because um, it could, be a saturation effect or there could be additional benefit, okay? But certainly the high ad was more effective here, but not as effective as the MySight lens over three years, but it's another option you can have for your patient. Well, what about spectacle lenses? Well, the early attempts of putting plus in the periphery were relatively unsatisfactory. So uh, the BHVI group looked at a whole host or, or three different kinds of essentially um, concentric progressive, progressive addition lenses. So you got sort of the correction in the middle and then increasing plus towards the edge. And the treatment effect overall over 12 months was about 0.05 millimeters, so not very good, all right? But they did in a subgroup analysis, found the younger kids uh, with at least one myopic parent um, were uh, more effective, it was more effective. So the design was commercialized by Zeiss as the Maya vision lens, and then a group of Japanese researchers did an additional clinical trial. What did they find? Even if you recruit younger kids with at least one myopic parent, which is pretty easy in Japan, um, you got no effect, okay? This is an ineffective therapy, which fortunately is unavailable in the US. Now, things changed a lot a couple of years ago with uh, um, the introduction of the uh, DIMS lens, the Defocus Incorporated Segment Lens, DIMS. And their two-year data were very compelling, okay? So over two years, they found about a half diopter slow-in of myopia and about a 0.3 millimeter slow-in of axial elongation, okay? That got my attention, okay? Is this lens coming to the US anytime soon? I don't think so, because I see no evidence of any FDA related trials, okay? But I don't know for sure. Um, another thing, another device that was in the use, in the news was uh, sight glasses lens, these DOT lenses. Slightly different, they're not using reflect, refractive effect here, they're using a kind of diffusive blur. Um, but they presented their results um, from a randomized clinical trial at the Academy last year. So we should maybe see these in uh, this in print sometime soon. And um, again, they're sort of most effective of their two test lenses, slow progression by 0.4 and slow elongation 
um, by 0.15. Um, so that's about twice as, as effective as a PAL. These are just one year results and we need to await the longer term results. Maybe we'll see two year results at this year's Academy. Um, but this is an FDA clinical trial and of all the spectacle lens companies, this group seems to be furthest along. Then of course, uh, Essilor came to the party recently and started talking about their Stellus lens, which is based on HAL technology, which I'll explain to you in a minute. But these, this lens has a series of concentric lenslets, which have a, a spheric profile of between three and five and a half diopters, okay? So the power actually varies across the lens and increases, or the, um, the, the ad power, if I can call it that, increases towards the periphery because you wanna hit the further periphery um, harder. So they published earlier this year their one year results, okay? And what you can see here is for the HAL lens, which is the highly aspherical lenslets, um, you got a very compelling effect. Um, then they presented the two year data at the Arvo meeting a couple of months ago, and they've got good, um, good retention of the subjects. But what you can see this HAL lens, which is the one that's being marketed in some parts of Europe and Southeast Asia now, that's the Stellus lens, it's slowing uh, myopia by 0.8 diopters over two years and slow in axial elongation by 0.35. So this is again, a very promising therapy. Now, finally, I'm gonna talk about atropine and uh, because that's our most effective uh, current option when it comes to pharmaceuticals. Now, the data at the top were from the original ATOM study, okay? 400 kids randomized to atropine 1% or a placebo this was a unilateral study, okay? They didn't want to um, impair the kids, so they only treated one eye, but the placebo eyes um, progressed by a diopter and a quarter over two years. The atropine eyes only uh, progressed by about a quarter diopter. So you got a treatment effect approaching uh, one diopter. So they did another study, unfortunately without a control group, and they looked at three lower concentrations. And perhaps somewhat surprisingly, they found all of them were fairly effective, almost as effective as the 1%. Okay, so hallelujah. Great, we've got a low concentration atropine that doesn't impair accommodation or dilate the pupil that much that um, uh, is effective. Okay, um, but there's a problem with the data. So here's the, um, the author's figure. I'm just going to focus on the first two years before the washout. And you can see that on first glance, the refractive error and the axial elongation data look very similar. But when we look closely, I'm gonna colorize them for you. So I'm gonna show the placebo group from the first study, remember, is in green. And the 0.01%, the most commonly prescribed percentage of atropine these days is in red. And what you can see that based on the previous slide that I showed you, consistent with that, you've got a slowing of myopia progression with the 0.01% atropine, okay? You look on the right, there's no effect on axial elongation. So we've got a paradox here. And what we really need, of course, is additional clinical trials to untangle that, which is correct, the refractive error data or the axial elongation data. So one of the studies that was published, and this now, these data are about two years old now, is from the LAMP study in Hong Kong, and they looked at three different concentrations between 0.05 and 0.01. Um, this was a bilateral treatment trial, 400 subjects um, randomized to those three concentrations or a placebo. You can see on the left, the uh, spherical equivalent data, on the right, the axial length data. And what you can see is the nice dose response effect, okay? Um, with the 0.05 giving you a quite nice chunky slowing of myopia or about um, half a diopter and slowing axial elongation by about 0.2 millimeters. But if you look at the 0.01% atropine, it's relatively ineffective. It's slowing myopia by less than a quarter of diopter over that year and barely touching the axial length, okay? So that's, that's good. Um, this has been supported by four more clinical trials in the past year, which I'm just going to rattle through very quickly here. Okay, so this study that was published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, okay, 
400 myopic children, they actually used two concentrations of atropine. Um, there was a little difference between them, but their one year data, 0.01%, slightly less than a quarter diopter, slightly less than 0.1 millimeter slowing of progression. Study published in uh, JAMA Ophthalmology, that's the, one of the big journals. Again, you see almost identical results. Myopic children, China, slowing of about a quarter, slowing of elongation of about uh, 0.1 millimeters. Study out of India, published again in a, a high ranking journal, very similar result, even less effect. And then finally, we've got um, the Atom J study, which was conducted in Japan. That's where the J comes from. Two year study here. Um, kids randomized again to placebo or 0.01%. And again, a very unremarkable effect. In fact, the smallest of all of those treatment trials with only a 0.04 millimeter slowing of axial elongation um, in one year. Um, somewhat paradoxically, there was a, an increased treatment effect um, in the second year, but we do see that sometimes in other studies, if there's not much effect in the first year, you get a better effect in the um, subsequent year. So I'm summarizing here the atropine studies. So when you plot those one year atropine data from those five clinical trials I've talked about, the 0.01% atropine is way down there amongst our most ineffective therapies. Um, it's less effective than on the left here, the various soft lens options. I don't have the blink study on there. Um, but the one at the top, the most effective of the surf lens options is the MySight study. And on the right are the studies that um, used Ortho-K. Um, finally, I've just superimposed the three spectacle lens studies I talked about, the DIMS, the Stellast, and the Sight Glass, and you can see how they are. So what I would say to you is 0.01% atropine is an ineffective therapy to use something stronger, but also be the doctor. Okay, and what I recommend to people is they perhaps start at a higher concentration, 0 0.025, 0 0.02, maybe even 0 0.05 in a younger kid. Treat one eye for a couple of weeks, see the patient. How much is the pupil dilated? How much is their accommodation affected? Then make a bilateral prescribing decision. <coughs> so I'm going to end there.